Halloween, Friday the 13th, A Nightmare on Elm Street. Those are some of the longest running franchises in horror history. But what if I told you there's one that outnumbers them all? Don't believe me? Well, allow me to introduce you to Puppet Master. This series has 15 movies and is one that not many people have heard of. And that's honestly surprising considering that, well, I didn't know much about the series. I knew the name. What I did not know, however, is that there's 15 of them. In my research for this, I discovered that the series is not well received, although I'm not that surprised considering that it's about puppets um and none of them have a higher score than a 5.9 on imdb which by the way that's the score i'll be using when i am referencing them not rotten tomatoes because according to rotten tomatoes puppet master the littlest reich is a 70 percent no no it is not but i decided that i would make the ultimate sacrifice that no one asked for and watch all of them so you don't have to I'm Adam Maker, and welcome to my own personal hell where I try to explain a series that somehow has 15 entries. How the fuck do you make 15 movies about this? How is it one of the longest running horror franchises ever and like no one's heard about it? If I made 15 movies like fully funded movies with actors, or in this case puppets, and no one has heard of them, I'd probably kill myself. Also, this series has a major focus on Nazis. I've watched a lot of shitty movies like Into the Storm, Jack and Jill, the Joss Whedon cut of Justice League, but this series might be what actually breaks me. So just to explain what's going on, I will be explaining each movie to the best of my abilities so you guys can understand just how batshit insane this franchise is at some points. Also, stay tuned at the end where I rank them all from worst to best because I hate myself. The first movie in this fever dream of a franchise starts off in 1939 where Andre Toulon, get used to that name, a puppeteer, who, who would have thought, you know, is in a hotel finishing off a puppet. Anyway, two totally not suspicious guys in black show up and Toulon kills himself, a completely reasonable reaction. Also, the puppets are already alive. He doesn't possess them like I thought he would. I don't know. I thought this was going to be like Chucky or Dead Silence, both of which I'd rather be watching. Whatever. Then it jumps to present day, aka 1989. I'm sure it made sense at the time. Uh, we, we're at Yale University. A dude with the most 80s haircut ever has a dream where a dude is holding a woman hostage with a gun and he starts to bleed. Why? Because he was stabbed? No, that might make a little bit of sense. No, it's actually leeches. Because, well, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. Later, there's a gathering where the 80s haircut man meets up with this guy with a douchebag haircut and a psychic, um, and basically they're like, hey, who is Neil? Uh, which is a fair question. Who is Neil? Fuck you. He's dead. 
Oh, and he killed himself too. Anyway, when they get onto an elevator, the psychic actually sees a vision, flashback, whatever you want to call it, to a rape that happened in that elevator years before. Uh, don't worry about it. It never comes back into the story. What is this movie? I was told it was about puppets, and all I've seen is two suicides and a rape. What the fuck is this? On a quick side note, something I thought was interesting when I was doing research for this was that the official TV guide review for this movie called it a pointless variation of the killer doll genre, which, yes it is. Then why is there 15 of them? Also, fun fact, this movie's supposed to get a theatrical release until Paramount, the distributor, was like, you know what? Maybe let's not release it. Never mind. We're good. And then it went straight to VHS. If they only knew what was still to come. Okay, so hear me out. Uh, some time goes by and the lady, uh, psychic, and the douchebag haircut guy uh, go into a room and the lady psychic begins to get super turned on for the douchebag haircut guy. But he promptly rejects her like the man of God he is. And because women don't know what no means, she continues to press on. Um, I'll be honest, there's no romantic chemistry between these two at all and no relationship has been established so this is just happening for whatever reason i don't i don't understand then it cuts to neil remember neil the second guy in this movie to kill himself at least he had the de decency to do it off screen um i'd like to point out that he has a picture of the last supper in his casket um that's never explained uh then a puppet with human sized hands just comes out of it I, I don't know. Uh, then there's a dinner scene where one of the ladies who I think owns the hotel tells a sad story and it's kind of touching and I don't care. You don't care. We're just going to move on. This movie has literally been just relationship quarrels that I could not give less of a shit about. I thought this was about puppets. Okay, so like a minute after that scene, around 38 minutes, a puppet, the weird one with the big hands, uh, steals a fire prong thing and kills a lady by lightly tapping her on the forehead. Thir 38 minutes. 38 minutes and all you fuckers could muster was a cheap ketchup spray on a log. 38 minutes? I hate this movie so much and it it's only the first one so the lady that owns the hotel and was married to neil faints because neil is sitting upright and i just want all of these people to die they all suck they deserve to die well after some pointless nudity the puppets finally start killing more people kind of actually they still just are stalking people right now they're not killing anyone and yes i'm aware that the puppets do have names i i don't particularly care about them um so the psychic and the douchebag haircut guy uh decide to have sex this has nothing to the movie until it does uh the puppets yes there are actually puppets in this movie called puppet master are still just st stalking and not doing anything but sadly, for the, the couple uh, having sex, it's uh, interrupted by some puppets who kill them. Rightfully. The one puppet kills the psychic by using a drill on his head, and then a lady puppet throws up leeches and kills the guy. By the way, the first kill of the movie was at 38 minutes, and the second is at 52 minutes. So 14 minutes between the kills, which is amazing. Uh, so I forgot to mention this, that along with the 80s haircut guy, the douchebag, and the psychic, there's actually this blonde lady who, to be honest, I have no idea what purpose she has, but she steals Neil's body. Why? I don't know. She dies immediately after, so it doesn't matter. To be honest, I zoned out for the next few minutes and have no idea what happened and have no desire to go back and figure it out. Anyway, the movie ends. 80s haircut guy and the hotel owner lady live. The puppets are never explained. Why are they alive? Who cares? Why do they breathe? That's weird, but I don't care. I hate this movie. It's only the first one. Neil's not actually dead after a stupid twist about magic and puppets, but then the puppets kill him anyway, so I guess he is dead. Also, everyone in this died because of puppets, so they deserve to die and how are there 14 more of these oh and guess what when it comes to the timeline this is number six next yes just one year later in 1990 the gods felt that after the reagan administration we deserved a gift but we got this instead while the second film released and called puppet master 2 it's actually eighth in the timeline because i guess this franchise just does whatever it wants so the film starts off in the band of misfit toys pours a mysterious green liquid into a hole in the ground that is revealed to be the grave as Toulon. you know the guy who offed himself in the opening of the first one then after an annoying amount of credits a staple of this franchise i have come to learn we are back at the hotel from the first 
first one. Does it have a name? Probably. I don't care. Uh, two cardboard cutouts. I mean, paranormal investigators are here to figure out what happened to everyone in the previous movie, which is fair enough. There was some weird shit in the last one. Anyway, it cuts to a farm where the farmer and his wife are dressed like it's reconstruction for some reason. And then this lady stops by and is like, hey, how do I find this hotel? The farmer is pretty dismissive and then his wife comes up to ask him if the fence is ready because it's electric. The lady asks why they have an electric fence, which it's a farm. It's kind of a common thing, I would think. Uh, but they explain to this lady that something has been killing livestock and that a mule had their head torn up and whatever it is ate the brain. Admittedly, that is weird, but the lady's reaction is immediately just animal mutilation? Maybe it's a cult. Are there Satanists in the area? What kind of question is that? Why is it the first thing you would ask? Then it's just ignored. There is no follow-up. Okay, cool. So we go back to the paranormal investigators. Where are the puppets? I just want to see puppets kill people. Why is this so hard for a movie called Puppet Master? Also, it turns out Talon is doing weird shit in the attic because of course he is, and it turns out that Talon was actually buried on the premises of the hotel. Now that's what I call good service. You can't see it, but my face is currently in my hands. Because, oh my god! Anyway, the cult lady who talked to the farmers is at the hotel, and while talking to a very poorly lit bust of Neil, remember Neil? Fuck you, Neil. While talking to his, again, poorly, you know, horribly lit bust, uh, the puppets pull her to the ground and gag her. The whole time, this lady looks like she is at most inconvenienced. But hey, at least this time it only took 20 minutes for the puppets to kill someone. I'm really stretching to say nice things about this. So two people that I could not care enough about to learn their names are about to have sex, but sadly Drillhead opens the door to a sleeping guy's room and they hear it, so they try to go save him before he can drill that guy's face. That is not a sex joke, I swear, but they fail. The sleeping guy got his face drilled and he dies. R.I.P. Who cares? That's two deaths in five minutes. Great job, Puppet Master 2, you did it. Uh, to be completely honest, like nothing worth talking about happens until, um, hey, remember that farmer couple from earlier? Yeah, well, the husband dies. Uh, the puppet who threw up the leeches in the last one just kind of stabs him. There, there's no leeches. Why were there leeches in the last one? I, I honestly still don't know. His wife, however, is able to put the puppet in a furnace. All right. <laughs> and then Blade, yes, actually, that one's name. The one with the top hat, his name is Blade. Uh, he distracts her and then flamethrower arm, lights her on fire. Boy, that escalated quickly. All the others were just stabbing people and throwing up leeches and now we got flamethrower arm. Talon's back, by the way. He has his face wrapped up and he seems almost younger now than he did when he was, you know, killing himself. Uh, maybe it's the mysterious green liquid from the beginning. It just takes the years away. You feel 20, you know, you feel 20 again. I, I don't know. Then there's like this weird flashback that I don't want to explain. It's honestly, it's just Talon in Egypt in 1920. The puppets get burned and that's basically it. There you go. Uh, then flamethrower arm just kills a child. Can you guess how he did it? Although to be honest, the kid was a dick, so it's fine. I will be completely honest with you. I have no idea what happens for the next like 20 minutes. I do know that Talon goes on a rant about his Elsa and how they can't take her. I think it's a love interest. Probably. Why are these killer puppet movies so boring and about nothing? Nothing is happening. It's just people dicking around in a hotel. Nothing has happened. Also, just seeing flamethrower arm just kill a kid that's not even a part of the story, like he just goes out of his way to kill this kid, is kind of funny to me. Uh, then there's this weird dance scene with Talon and the uh, one girl, and it's just awkward. Like, I'm, I'm uncomfortable watching this. Like, it got under my skin how much I did not want to see them dance. Also, remember how their one friend got his head drilled in? They don't seem to care because they're busy dancing with the man who created the puppets that killed their friend. Whatever, then the guy and the girl, they kiss, have some of that early 90s movie sex, and I kind of wanted that. Well, after that hot and steamy 90s movie sex, the guy is killed by Blade, who then also kills the girl. Cool, they're sinners. Cleanse the earth, you little puppet bastards. After that, this other girl goes to Talon's attic, then Talon vaguely kind of just stumbles towards her. For the dude she was banging, almost dies by flamethrower arm, but thanks to the power of nudity, he survives and goes to rescue the girl. Meanwhile, Talon is trying to turn her into a reincarnation of his wife. What the f Talon also reveals his face after rotting for 50 years. Oh my God, kill it, look at that thing, it's horrifying. The dude trying to save the girl, by the way, just bashes flamethrower arm with a fire extinguisher. It's fitting, I guess. 
And then he just throws Blade down an elevator shaft. The dude's a fucking beast. Okay, so I said that Talon's plan is to reincarnate his Elsa and himself. So to do that, he has to take uh, bodies of previous victims and make them look like they are both them. And then for the new bodies, he has to put a funnel in the mouth of his body, slit his throat, and bleed into it. Okay, first off, he's been in the ground like 50 years at this point. How does he have any blood left? But he's in the new body. Cool. Then she has to make the girl drink a cup of no-no juice. She spits it onto Blade. Then the puppets just start attacking Toulon for like no reason. Um, and then the guy and the girl escape. The thing is, I have no idea why the puppets turned on Toulon. It's never explained. But Toulon uh, gets lit on fire and he jumps out the window. Also, when he does that, he becomes invisible, but he's still on fire and then the movie ends. I am now dumber for having sat through it. Oh, and if you cared, which I'm sure you didn't, but the couple who lived end up in 90s California. Yeah, enjoy that while you can. The cult lady from the beginning is brought back to life by the puppets themselves, put into the other body that wasn't used from Talon's ceremony. She takes the puppets in a van, uh, she says they're going to go to the Institution for Mentally Ill Children. This never comes back. Like, this is the only time you will ever see that woman, that van, and any reference to this institution. It's never mentioned again. I'd also like to point out that at the end, when the lady brings up the institution, it's implied she's reading from a sign. But the angle they use when the van leaves, there's no sign anywhere. How is this worse than the first one? Next! Now we move on to Puppet Master 3, Talon's Revenge. So I guess what happened in the last one wasn't him getting revenge. I guess it was him just fucking around and finding out. So after two pretty terrible movies in a terribly rendered hotel, the third film takes place in Germany in 1941. Naturally. So Andre Talon, who is not dead despite killing himself in 1939 in California, is in Germany in 1941. Three movies in, and they're already having trouble keeping the timeline straight. Great. Anyway, Talon, who has been established in the previous movies as a world-renowned puppeteer, gains the attention of the Nazis, who I guess want to create a puppet army, because that's going to win the war. Puppets. Also, I want us to say this now, this is the highest rated one, with the 5.9. In the opening scene, we see a Nazi doctor who is casually waiting for a wounded man to die, uh, meeting with an SS officer. See, the doctor is trying to create a drug that is able to reanimate the dead, and the SS officer is a dick because it's not working. The wounded man then dies. Then the officer bitches at him and even threatens him. Also, for some reason, the Nazi driver is playing with a marionette while waiting for the officer to be done being an asshole. <laughs> oh yeah, that guy's not actually dead, because they never were. Uh, the officer kills the man with invisible bullets, and then we cut to some needlessly long credits. Seriously, the credits in these movies are so long, they make Marvel blush. They're not even interesting, it's just blue text on a black background, while a so-so score plays in the background. So after the credits, we see a not-decaying Andre Toulon performing a puppet show for children, which is actually really weird. It's a six-armed cowboy shooting at Hitler. At least he's anti-Hitler. After the show, a dude that totally looks like a snitch complains that the show was anti-Hitler. This scene is where we discover, once again, the puppets have always been alive. This time, we actually kind of are given a reason as to why, as uh, Talon injects the puppets with a mysterious green fluid, which I guess makes them alive. It's very vague, but you know what? It's kind of an explanation, so I'll take it. Uh, Talon then gives his wife a puppet that looks like her, which I suppose is romantic, but to me it's just weird. She even says it's beautiful. No, it's really not. She even says the magic word, I'm never going to leave you. Never. I'm sure she won't. Also, Toulon is supposed to be German, but he doesn't have an accent. And you will cry me mercy. Well, after some pointless nudity in a very uncomfortable scene that I can't show you for obvious reasons, I pity the girls in this scene though, because they are rubbing a topless man in a tub. Why? I don't know. But after that incredibly important scene, the Nazis show up at Talon's house, and can you guess what happens next? Is it A, Talon gives them the green liquid and lives out the rest of his life with his wife? B, the Nazis buy the green liquid and Talon becomes a millionaire? Or C, his wife is killed and the Nazis take the green liquid and kidnap Talon? 
If you guys see it, then congrats, you've seen a movie before. So being taken away by the Nazis, Drillhead drills into some Nazis while the one with big hands crushes another's neck. At least it only took 15 minutes for the puppets to kill someone in this one. I'll give this movie some credit for that. Real quick, are the puppets heroes or villains? In the first two, they're killing random people in a hotel for no reason, and now they're killing Nazis. Is this a redemption arc? What is this? Anyway, Talon escapes and now Nazis are chasing him because that's what I expected when watching something called Puppet Master, a man escaping capture from the Nazis. I'd also like to point out that they use an unrelated B-roll for this shot. Like, it's clearly from a different movie. One that I'd much rather be watching. So after the shot that is clearly from a different movie, the Nazis invade Talon's house, destroy some of the puppets, and then burn it down. Okay, I think it's time to speed up a little bit. Talon cries, the doctor looks at the green liquid, calls Talon a genius, and the Nazis search for Talon. Oh, and he's crazy now. It's just a switch from a sort of crazy puppeteer who gave his puppets life to I'm going to kill the entire Third Reich because they killed my wife. Very ambitious goal, I must say. And I will admit that I take back the joke about the name of this movie. It, it does make sense now. Oh, and big hands kill someone. Yes, puppets killing people. This is what I want from these movies. Uh, then the weird smiley one stabs another. He only gets half points because he didn't actually kill him he just stabbed him oh uh by the way yeah talon made the puppet of his wife come to life and i think he wants to fuck it the way he says elsa to that thing gives me serious i want to fuck the puppet vibes then like a sane man he puts a leech in the puppet leeches why is it always leeches what is with these movies and leeches Oh, and the dude who's uh, snitch gets killed by the puppets. Good, fuck that guy. And you know what they say, right? Snitches get a leech down their throat from a puppet. That's the saying, right? Also, while the puppet murder has been cool, this movie is so boring. It's just people talking about nothing and then some puppets kill some people, which wouldn't be a bad formula, but I don't care what they're talking about. If you've seen any other movies with Nazis, they're saying the same things. We must win the war. Hitler, Heil, it's all boring. Talon, then posing as a blind man, leaves the six-armed cowboy at a brothel that a Nazi general's at. The six-armed cowboy shoots and kills the Nazi general, sending him through the brothel window. I never in my life thought I would say a sentence like that. How is this movie incredibly boring while also being one of the most insane things I've ever watched? Although, after that, nothing really happens. The kid character is introduced, but he's kind of a meaningless character in the end. The weird doctor guy comes back and talks to Talon, who then threatens him with the puppets, obviously. Talon actually reveals that he figured out how to give life to the puppets while on a trip to Egypt, which makes the flashback from the previous movie make sense. Uh, but all the puppets are people that Talon actually knew. They were people that had been killed by the Nazis and then with the green liquid and the human spirit were given a second chance at life. Second chance at life while being a puppet, granted, but a second chance nonetheless. To be honest, I don't hate this explanation. It wasn't what I expected and it's not as stupid as it could have been. It doesn't explain why they randomly kill people in the first two movies though. Wanting to kill Nazis? Completely understandable. Wanting to kill some idiots in a hotel? Not so much. So anyway, all this leads to the Doctor and Talon escaping until the Doctor is stabbed by a Nazi. Uh, Talon then sees what's left of his old house. Like, nothing really changed, it's just a bit crispier. Uh, then we see that flashback from the second one where Talon is in Egypt, nothing is gained from it. Then the random ass child from earlier then swears his allegiance to the Puppet Master. And then the head Nazi gets lung cancer and is then killed by Talon and the puppets. Roll the fucking credits, we survived another one. Well, that that's it. If there's one nice thing I can say about it is that it's shorter than the first at only an hour and 22 minutes. To be completely honest, out of the first three, this one is probably the best. The puppets do a nice amount of murdering. We get a decent amount of backstory and explanation for why all this is happening. And if you were curious about where this one goes in the timeline, it actually comes second chronologically. Next! Okay, first things first. They went from Roman numerals to Roman numerals, but with a subtitle, to just normal, regular numbers with no subtitles. Cool. But also, I want to point out that at the end of 3, it said Puppet Master 4, when bad puppets turn good, was going to be the next one. Now it's just called Puppet Master 4. And actually, according to Wikipedia, it was supposed to be called Puppet Master the Demon at one point. Why are there so many names for this movie? It doesn't really matter, though. Um, it's Puppet Master 4. Okay, so according to the official chronological timeline for the series, 4 is actually the direct sequel to 2 and the ninth film in the timeline. 
Everybody ready? Let's do this. So like I said, this one is a direct sequel to two. So it starts off in what the fuck is that? There's what I'm assuming is the demon from the former subtitle uh, who desperately needs a manicure, I might add. Then we see some fetuses, I guess. I honestly have no idea what those are. But hey, at least at least this time the score is interspersed with footage and a somewhat decent score. Okay, honestly, I'm already confused. You see a demon talking about wanting to steal back the power from Talon that he used for the puppets. But let me, okay, so let me get this straight. Talon figured out reincarnation from demons, no less, and used them to create puppets. You know what? I respect it. Then we cut to a person driving in the rain, touching their box. That That's not a joke, by the way. That's just what's happening. Now we meet a doctor whose name isn't important at Science Incorporated who gets a special delivery and it's a demon, I think. Yeah, I'd say it's a demon. The demon thing then blues all over her face. Again, that's not a joke. That's literally just what's happening. While some other demons watch. Why are there so many demons? Oh right, the subtitle for this one was The Demon. My bad. Anyway, we cut to- God damn it! It's the fucking hotel again! Fuck! At the hotel, we see Rick, who I will be calling Plank because that sums up his acting ability, who is basically the stereotypical 90s genius nerd type. He's building laser tag robots while listening to metal while also being watched by Blade, who is just watching him. Not gonna kill this one, Blade? What's the matter? Don't you feel stabby today? Whatever. Plank then says into a recorder, their behavior was utterly predictable and- I wish I could say the same thing about the people who wrote this, but this series has honestly been nothing but batshit insanity. Now we see Dr. Baker, another scientist at Science Incorporated, testing a rotating blade. I'm sure that won't come into play later. The movie then goes back to Plank, who is changing his shirt, and then Blade turns his head like he wants to kill him. Fair enough. Uh, you've been stuck with him a lot longer than me. We then cut back to Dr. Baker, who gets the same packet as a lady who died in the beginning. Then we cut back once again to Plank, whose date for the night brought some friends along, one of which, Cameron, who I'll be calling Dave for obvious reasons. Calls him the Rickster. Kill him. Not I'm not I'm not talking to the puppets. I'm talking to Plank. Plank, I give you full permission to kill that man. I fully support it. So they come into the hotel and Plank explains that he is the caretaker for the hotel during the off season. Then Dave asks, I'm starved. Where's Dindin? I wish nothing but suffering upon this man's bloodline. Also, Plank's comeback to the Rickster is haven't changed a bit, have you? Cameron. Which is just pitiful. So we go back to Dr. Baker who puts the demon thing in a metal thing. It's, it looks like a furnace to me, but I honestly don't know what it is. Whatever. The demon growls from the inside. Dr. Baker opens it and then it kills him off screen, of course. And then it fades to black back to the fucking hotel. Oh, hey, this is a Puppet Master film, so here's Blade. So yeah, Blade is running around. Uh, he sees Talon outside of a window telling him that he is with him. And if you're curious, Dr. Baker is getting his face blued by a demon. If you don't need more confirmation that Dave is a dick, he's smoking at the dinner table, which is just horrible manners. As the four leave, Dave's girlfriend finds Blade laying on the floor and decides to hold him. She then looks into Blade's eyes and immediately asks where the box he came from is. But she isn't satisfied with Plank's answer. She gets angry and Plank sends her to a storage room to look for a different box, which she then finds and then dies. I'm kidding. She f she just faints. Dave's girlfriend then yells at Plank to not open the trunk, to which he immediately tries to open. Dave then tries and fails. And then when being told that his girlfriend is scared, Dave just says... What the fuck are you so scared of? Then when the two girls leave, he says... <gasps> Women can't live with them. Can't shoot them. Yes, that is correct. Killing women is wrong and something that you can't do. What the fuck is wrong with this guy? I get they're trying to make him unlikable, but what the fuck? Smoking at dinner, prime 90s douchebag behavior, complaining you can't kill women. Who does this guy think he is? Patrick Bateman? Oh, um, if you're curious, Talon's still here. Uh, after all that, Plank then decides to put some acid on the lock of the trunk, which immediately just opens, and they rummage through it. They even find the passport Talon used to get out of Germany. Yeah, remember he killed that Nazi, then stole his identity and left Germany? Like a fucking beast! Also, if you're curious, the man who complained he can't shoot women hates Nazis. 
hate those guys. Well, at least he hates Nazis. Bare minimum to not be a complete scumbag achieved. Plank then finds Talon's diary, which delivers some mighty convenient exposition, and then they find out the puppets' names, which, hey, I don't even know them, so good on them. Then these actual scientists decide to inject the puppets with green liquid so they can come alive. Well, I guess it's true what they say. The line between science and sanity is very thin, but also science would have you researching or at least thinking about it. Um, this is just insanity. Uh, Big Hands, the six-armed cowboy, Drillhead all come to life, and Big Hands tries to kill Dave, which is for some reason stopped. This movie was so close to being perfect. The big demon from the beginning, by the way, is back and says that everyone has to die and then the scene ends. That was so worth watching, wasn't it? Uh, back at the hotel, Plank gives Spinny Face an injection and he just jumps off the table and is gone. Uh, then the power goes out. Susie then says they should call it a night. Yes, after giving life to those puppets, going to sleep is exactly what I would do. Dave then drags the trunk into the bedroom and then brings out a Ouija board. Meanwhile, Plank is giving the puppet upgrades, because that's what these little hellions need. Upgrades because they weren't deadly enough. Actually, they just play laser tag. The puppets in this one actually are kind of chill. They haven't killed anyone, and they're just playing laser tag. Listen to metal. Why am I enjoying this? Despite not having much killing in it, it's actually kind of been enjoyable. It's got a lot of issues, don't get me wrong, but I'm actually having a good time with this one. During the laser tag game, however, one of the boxes that had been delivered to the scientists earlier gets dropped off, and Plank's girlfriend brings it in. Also, Dave is making his girlfriend summon demons, like the true romantic he is. His girlfriend connects to the afterlife, and Dave is able to speak to Talon and discovers the secret of the green liquid, which ends up summoning the demon creatures, and then Dave and his girlfriend die. No, actually, I am kidding, the idiots are still alive. One of the demons gets close to Plank, but Big Hands and Blade are able to scare him off. Yeah, the big twist in this one is the puppets are the good guys. Granted, the tagline on the poster kind of gave it away, when, when bad puppets turn good. I did not expect them to fight demons, though. That is actually a twist I did not expect. Something less surprising is that the car doesn't start when Dave and his girlfriend try to leave. Then Dave, Mr. Feminism himself. Yeah, push. She doesn't really fight him, but she just kind of gets out and then he locks the door. What a, what a man, I must say. Then thankfully, one of the demons kills Dave. Are we sure these demons are the bad guys? Killing Dave is a very heroic thing to do. Blade finally sees some action in this one and fights off one of the demons, and then Plank discovers the box his girlfriend brought in during puppet laser tag has been broken out of. Dave's girlfriend then rushes back in and tells him the good news, I mean sad news, uh, that Dave is dead. Plank goes to check in on Dave uh, and gets attacked, but manages to fend off the attack and escapes. The puppets then start fighting the demons in a fight that's about as exciting as you'd expect. Blade, Drillhead, and Big Hands then work together to mutilate the fuck out of one of the demons. Uh, one side thing I want to point out is all the blood in those movies looks like jelly, just something I want to point out. After some terrible green screen, the puppets open a box, revealing another puppet that they then bring to life by shocking him with lightning. The puppets also kill one of the demons with lightning, so that's cool. Also, the puppets, the other puppets, you know, bring out and they try to bring back to life. Well, they do get shocked by lightning, and Talon's head appears on it. Would you believe me if I said that Talon is with you? Because he is. He also gives a ton of exposition to Plank, and to be honest, it's not worth repeating. Wh what is going on? I'll say what's going on. Plank's girlfriend kills one of the demons, and then Talon speaks through Dave's girlfriend for some reason, but he says Plank needs to do some science and give life to yet another puppet, which he does. The puppet known as Decapitron then kills all the demons. Talon then tells Plank that the puppets are his, and he is the puppet master, and that he'll always be around if he needs help. I don't know what to say to that. How was this written by six people? How? How do six people manage to write this? But somehow, this one is actually not bad. It uh, it has many problems from wooden acting and a pretty weak plot, but it somehow managed to be the most enjoyable one I've seen so far. Uh, and like I said, this film, despite being the fourth release, is actually the ninth in the timeline, so that's good to keep in mind next. <laughs> Puppet Master 5, the final chapter. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Let's get this over with. Despite the poster and Wikipedia page calling this one the final chapter, the title at the beginning actually doesn't say that. I don't know, I just thought it was interesting. To my surprise, the film actually continues the story from the last one, unlike in 2 where they don't follow up with the characters from the first one. This one is actually a direct sequel. Bold move, let's see how it turns out. So after the events of the last one, Plank is in jail for the murder of Cameron. You remember Cameron, right? Well, Plank was charged with his murder, along with the murder of the two scientists that were also killed by the demons. While being interrogated, we learn that Plank graduated MIT at 14, which I don't think is legal. I should also mention that I actually have no idea if it is or not, and I refuse to check. <laughs> Thank you.
The cop then shows Plank the video of the lady doctor being killed, which honestly, it just sounds like porn. Like, why is she moaning like that? Okay, so now Plank is doing narration and giving some exposition about the last film. Guess they were really struggling to get it to feature length. And technically speaking, it's not even feature length. This movie is only an hour and 21 minutes long. Okay, so you know how I said Plank begins to give exposition about the previous film? That goes on for four and a half minutes. Four and a half minutes of just recapping the last movie. If I had known there was a recap of the fourth, then I would have just skipped it and watched this one. Also, it took five people to write this. Five people wrote this movie. Okay, so after that waste of four and a half minutes, we are sent back to the police station where Blade is in the evidence room and breaks out. I mean, he does have a knife for a hand, so I shouldn't be surprised. Blade then escapes because of course he does. He's Blade. You don't fuck with Blade. Plank is once again in an interrogation room where the new director of operations of the company he works for asked him personally what happened with the murders, which let's be real, everyone questioning what happened is completely right. Are they being dicks about it? I mean, yeah, but everyone questioning is completely right to do so. Because would you believe anyone that said, oh yeah, gremlins killed these people? No. No, you wouldn't. So everyone asking questions is completely right. Uh, Plank then explains to the guy what makes the puppets come alive, and he is reunited with his girlfriend while Blade escapes in her bag. Then they fuck. I'm actually kidding. Plank falls asleep before they can. So his girlfriend is disappointed. Which, let's be real, if his sex life is anything like his acting, she was going to be disappointed anyway. Uh, then we see the big demon in his chamber talking about something. I don't know what it is because the costume is honestly horrifying and not in a good way. I'm pretty sure he's bringing another gremlin to life. Um, if you're curious, the director of operations guy is just having business talks. What are they about? I'm going to assume business. What happens next, I don't even have words for, so I'm just going to show you. Yeah, I don't have an idea how to respond to that, so I just won't. But whatever that was, it was all a dream, and then Plank is surprised by Blade. The two of them then have a conversation and decide to go back to the fucking hotel. I'm sick of this goddamn hotel. Oh, and the psychic girlfriend from the last movie is in a coma. Wouldn't you love to get that job? Just, just lay in a bed and pretend to sleep? Hey, I'd, I'd do that. Um, so the demon thing is back again, and he cuts his hand and brings another gremlin to life. The director of operations, by the way, is breaking into the hotel to get the puppets. Also, that guy looks like Dave Chappelle. Just an observation. So just to be clear, the director guy wants the puppets because he thinks that they're robots, uh, which honestly makes a lot more sense than the real reason. Green liquid or robotics, I mean, from his perspective, the robotics makes complete sense. Also, they keep showing this same shot of lightning. They show it like five times. I guess they were just super proud of it. Uh, the cronies for the director guy then search around the hotel for the puppets. It goes about as well as you would expect. The girl in a coma then has a vision about the demon guy, which for some reason involves a lot of moaning. Whatever that's about. Plank and Blade then arrive at the hotel and begin their search for the other puppets. Whatever the demon is doing, it makes the girl in a coma immediately wake up. Not Dave Chappelle is then killed by a gremlin. Uh, Big Hands then punches a guy with a mullet. Uh, Blade and the six-armed cowboy then tell Plank about the director guy and his goons. The guy with the mullet then gets punched in the balls and is knocked out. The guy in the Brooklyn jacket then gets killed by the gremlin. Plank's girlfriend then breaks into the hotel to search for him. I just want to say, seeing the puppets be relatively good is just weird. Wait, can it be? It is! Torch! is back! Plank then guides the puppets and his girlfriend continues to be lost. The director guy is then chased by the gremlin. Torch and the six-armed cowboy then fight the gremlin and Plank and his girlfriend are then reunited. Then they bring back Decapitron while Blade's fighting the gremlin. Blade stabs the gremlin and then it flies away. Just flies away. Uh, the mullet guy is back and he gets into an elevator. Talon's head comes back and gives some wise words to Plank. It's then decided that they will leave the puppets to fend for themselves against the gremlin. Then the three leave in the elevator. The mullet man, if you were curious, gets killed by the gremlin. Director man then fights Plank in the elevator and knocks him out. And then he exits the elevator, uh, to which the elevator then goes back up with Plank still in it. The director man then is torched and then falls down the elevator shaft and dies. Good. He was a dick. The gremlin then tries to attack an unconscious plank, but have no fear. Talon is here with Blade, and they just beat the fuck out of it. Like, they, they beat the shit out of it, I think. Before the gremlin opens a portal and tries to escape, but fails. And there's an explosion, which for some reason causes the girl in the coma to wake up again. Hey, at least this time she's not weirdly moaning. Plank then stomps the head of the now very crispy gremlin. It then dissolves into a very poorly lit shot of Plank's girlfriend. Doesn't really add anything. Uh, Plank then explains her some very bad ADR that everything is going great with the puppets. Then Talon's head shows up once again. Uh, he pledges his allegiance 
allegiance to Plank, and then there's some narration, but the credits start to roll at the same time. It's almost like the movie couldn't wait to be over, which is fair, because oh my god, that was a drag. Yeah, this one was very weak. Definitely the one of the lower ranking ones. There was a lot of exposition and the story was just way too convoluted. And worst of all, it was just so boring. That, that was just so bad. Next. Believe it or not, Full Moon Entertainment actually did fully intend for 5 to be the last one, but according to Wikipedia, due to the financial success of 5 and a high demand from fans, just four years later, after it was supposed to be the final chapter, we would get Curse of the Puppet Master. Despite coming after the final chapter, the film actually takes place between 1 and 2 for some reason. This honestly would have worked better just taking place after the final chapter, but whatever. But nevertheless, here we are. I guess I should stop stalling now. This is for real, Curse of the Puppet Master. So thankfully, this film actually avoids having three straight minutes of credits to open the movie. Uh, thankfully, which is... You know, I, I do have to credit it for that. Uh, judging from what I've heard about this one, though, that might actually be the only thing I credit it for. Oh god, the leech woman's back. I really don't like her. Okay, so the puppets are in cages now, with spaces between the bars that literally any of them could just walk through. I mean, that seems like a... That's just bad design, really. I guess it's the thought that really counts. Or, you know, lack thereof. So we're introduced to a guy that, when I first saw him, I could have swore it was Talon, but it's just another old guy. He ties a puppet in a box and then takes it to the woods and lights it on fire. Guess what? The best part of all this, we can hear the puppet screaming as it's being burned. Is it being burned alive? They're technically alive, right? Doesn't matter. After that, we get the credits. And this time, the credits are just put over footage from previous movies. You know what? I'll take it. It's better than the blue text over a black background. I should also mention that once again, the credits are pretty insanely long. You know, they last three minutes, which this movie is only an hour and 17 minutes long. But hey, at least this one only had one writer. Also, it was directed by a woman. Look at you, Puppet Master, breaking ground. <laughs> so after the credits, we are taken to what I assume is a grandfather and his granddaughter, talking about how smart she is and how she's in college to bring pride to the family name. Then we get taken to a scene at a gas station, and to be honest, this, it looks so bad. It looks like it was filmed on a potato. Anyway, we are introduced to a stereotypical 90s bully, of course, who has a sweet sports car and a gang of cronies who bully Tank, a special person, or maybe not. It kind of goes back and forth as, as to whether what he is. I'm trying not to be offensive, I'm just going off what the movie's giving me. The grandfather and the granddaughter then confront the bullies, who then call the granddaughter a bitch and threaten to beat up the grandfather. Just checking all the boxes for being a 90s bully. Also, Tank's boss bullies him too. That's kind of a dick thing to do. Tank, by the way, has done nothing to anyone. He was just carving something. That's all he's done. That is all he has done this whole movie. He's just been sitting there carving away. Okay, so actually, after reading the Wikipedia, I was informed that that is not grandfather and granddaughter. It's father and daughter. Oh. Also, we learned that Tank is only paid 30 bucks a week. Oh, mid-90s, when $30 was actual money. So the father, Dr. McGrew, that's not going to be annoying to say, hires Tank to make some wood carvings and offers him $35 a week. Amazing. Okay, so Dr. McGrew shows Tank the puppets who are good again? I guess it's never actually established. But McGrew's daughter just holds up big hands like he's a pet. It's also revealed that McGrew bought the puppets at an auction. But if that's the case, how did the puppets get back to the hotel for Puppet Master 2? Why am I thinking about this? Once again, this film reminds me it was filmed on a potato and then two sheriffs decide to bully Tank because he is the world's punching bag, I guess. So McGrew has the puppets on display for his magic show, I guess, and just has the six-armed cowboy firing around civilians. That's the same puppet who killed a Nazi once, right? Like, he's been reduced to performing. What happened? I mean, he is a puppet, so I guess it makes perfect sense. Also, one of the sheriffs put his gum on Big Hand's head, so you know for a fact that sheriff is going to die. Also, so Big Hand's and the daughter are like best friends. Like she holds him like a cat and talks to him also like a cat. So as mentioned before, Tank likes carving things. So McGrew took that as make Tank carve puppets out of wood. My brother in Christ, Tank liked to whittle little carvings and you're asking him to make puppets. What the fuck, dude? Also, this dude McGrew tells Tank that if he carves the puppets, they'll come to life, which rightfully Tank is confused by and says the most reasonable thing I've ever heard in these movies. These are just pieces of wood. No matter how perfect I carve them, they'll just be pieces of wood. Yes, Tank. You are right. Then McGrew says the scariest thing I've ever heard. You want to know how to make a dead thing live? You put your soul into them. No, I'm good. Thank you. And if I was Tank, I would get the fuck out of there. But no, it's a movie. So Tank stays and just carves the puppets for this man. For some reason. 
So after Tank does some carving, they're at dinner, and McGrew starts going on about how cool Blade is, which I mean, Blade is the coolest one, but it's also kind of weird. Like he says, take a look at Blade. He never tires, never hungers, knows no fear, tells no lies, feels no pain, has no secrets. Yeah, he certainly has no secrets. McGrew also thinks the world would be better if everyone was puppets. Okay. Uh, McGrew's daughter then rushes Tank to bed for what I'm going to assume is only holy and wholesome reasons. While Tank is carving, McGrew's daughter tries to get his attention by saying the house is on fire and then she's naked and then Tank cuts his hand. Good job. She then compliments his hands, and I'll be honest, I love his response. They come with the rest of me. Which, as someone who's been told how nice their hands are, a fucking man. Booger's daughter then tries to seduce Tank, but Tank is a man of God, and does a God damn it, Tank! No! Joke's on me for thinking we get a Puppet Master movie without a sex scene. Anyway, Tank keeps having these dreams of becoming a puppet, and to be honest, it is quite literally one of the most terrifying things I've ever seen. So as expected, Tank and McGrew's daughter have made things very awkward, you know, since they have done unholy acts and have made God cry. To be honest, there's nothing inherently wrong with this movie, like the script or acting wise, but I do have one question. Where the fuck are the puppets? Tank and McGrew's daughter then come across the remains of the doll that was burned in the beginning, and then the 90s bully essentially just assaults McGrew's daughter. And by essentially, I mean, yeah, he just assaults her. Like, it's just full on assault. It's very uncomfortable to watch, and I hated every second of it. Although, Tank does almost kill him, so there's that. Oh, and just one more thing. Where the fuck are the puppets? I thought this was Curse of the Puppet Master, not Curse of What the Fuck Am I Watching? It's been 45 minutes, and the puppets haven't killed anyone! What is the point of this? So the boy then decides to break into McGrew's daughter's bedroom and thankfully Big Hands attacks him, but unfortunately the bully just kills him, which rightfully pisses off the other puppets, so McGrew takes them and they just murder the fuck out of the bully. But before, the bully is using a bench press and talking to himself and pretending to what I can only describe as forcefully making McGrew's daughter do things. That's right. Do it, bitch. I said do it. Yeah, that's right. Oh yeah, you like that, don't you? Kill him! You know what? The line the puppets have been walking between good and evil has always been thin, but you know what? Just fucking kill this guy and they'll be the fucking heroes of this series, okay? I don't care. So Blade and Drillhead just kill the bully. Blade cuts out his eyes and Drillhead, to put it in the simplest terms, just drills his dick. Which, I'll be honest, was kind of cool. Granted, it took 52 minutes. 52 fucking minutes for a puppet to kill someone in a Puppet Master movie. There is 25 minutes of this movie left, and they just started killing people now. Okay, you know what? It's time to speed through some of this. Tank actually is able to save Big Hands and talks about nothing with McGrew's daughter. McGrew talks to his daughter about how she shouldn't be with Tank. Fair enough. McGrew's daughter then finds Tank white in the face while carving some puppets. McGrew and his daughter again talk about things that you don't care about. The sheriffs investigate the bully's death and bully the bully's friends. Whoever did the sighting in this movie, send them to death. It is so bad. I Look at this shot. It is so bad. So then McGrew's daughter leaves to go pick something up for her father, and then Tank wakes up tied up in his underwear. McGrew then unloads a whole lot of exposition and tells him that he is going to put Tank's soul into the puppet that Tank made. The sheriffs then arrive and have a standoff with McGrew. Blade and Drillhead then kill both the sheriffs. Honestly, that's fine. They're dicks. I'm anyway, uh, Tank is begging for his life. McGrew's daughter, who arrives at the place to pick something up for dad. Plot twist, there was nothing for her to pick up. It was just a distraction for him to suck the soul out of Tank. Wait, no, not like that. McGrew's daughter then goes and finds the burned remains of the last person her father sucked the soul out of, and then decides to rush back to the house. Sadly, McGrew has already sucked the soul out of Tank, and he becomes a puppet. Then the puppets turn on McGrew, for some reason. Like, just out of nowhere, they decide, fuck it, let's kill him! Cool! I mean, to me, that's perfectly fine, but plot-wise, it just happens. It makes no sense. McGrew's daughter then comes home to find her father sliced up, and Tank, now in a robot body, shoots electric at McGrew, cut to credits, it's over. What the hell was that ending? Like, it doesn't even have an ending. It just ends. It was like the movie couldn't wait to be over, so it just ended. Granted, I'm not upset about it, because it is over. I am, however, upset that I watched it. I didn't like it at all. There's no reason for this movie to be in the series. It honestly feels like they had another movie, realized it was shit, and then because of all the demand for another puppet master, we're just like, fuck it, we'll shove some puppets in it, and it just did nothing but make it worse. There was one positive. It was short. Thank God it's over. <laughs> Alright, 
Puppet Master of the Legacy. This one has the lowest score at a 2.7 on IMDb. So I'll be honest, I am a little scared. I also read on the wiki that this movie is mostly flashbacks. Fantastic. Can't wait to see things I've already seen. Okay, so these credits, I must admit, are not the worst. They are certainly not fun to watch, but as none of the credits have been for any of these movies, at least we can see the puppets, and these credits are only 90 seconds. You know how bad this series is that I've mentioned the credits every single time because it's one of the only consistent things in this franchise? And like the movie themselves, they're bad. Okay, I am so sick of this fucking hotel. What is so special about it? There are so many possibilities for killer puppets, but they keep us in this goddamn hotel. Anyway, here's a terribly lit scene where a woman is on the phone and then she looks at the book in front of her and tells the puppet master to reveal his secrets. So we then see footage from a previous movie. I'd tell you which one, but then I'd have to go back and figure that out, and I am not doing that. Anyway, the book then catches on fire. Amazing. I love this movie already. Okay, so remember back in Talon's Revenge, how he befriended that child? What was his name again? Oh yeah, that's right. Useless. Well, he is back because everyone remembers him, right? Well, Useless is in the basement of the hotel. What the fuck? Why does everyone end up at this hotel? It's never even open. It's always closed. So they have no reason to be there. Okay, Plank did, but he was the caretaker. But everyone else doesn't have a reason. What is so special about this godforsaken hotel? Is it because they already had the sets and didn't want to build anymore? You know what? That probably is it. Anyway, yeah, the woman then threatens to rob Useless and tells him she wants the formula. Why does everybody want this formula? It just brings puppets to life. It also brought Talon back that one time, but the series just kind of forgot about that. But why does everyone want this goddamn formula? Also, this one takes place after five. So technically speaking, this is the final entry in the series. But where's Plank? I liked Plank. Anyway, back to what I think is supposed to be a plot, we once again see footage from other movies because I'm pretty sure this one wouldn't even count as a short film without it. This movie, by the way, is only an hour and 13 minutes, in case you were curious. So the next six and a half minutes is all old footage from Retro. And if you were curious, yes, that is in fact Greg Sestero from the critically acclaimed movie, The Room. But yeah, that's all it is. It's literally just the last movie. It then cuts to a pointless shot of the woman and then goes right back to retro for another three and a half minutes. Like if you're just gonna show what happened in the previous movies, why are you even making one? Okay, so now we're back to Useless and the woman who kind of argue and I don't care. And then we get sent back to Puppet Master 3, which I have seen, but the difference in flashback from the one we just saw, well, that was, yeah, six and a half minutes, which is long. This one is 21 minutes and 20 seconds. This movie should have been called previously on Puppet Master, because that's all it is. It's just a recap of the previous movie. What's the point of watching them if this one is just gonna explain everything anyway? So after the extremely long flashback, which was 21 minutes and 20 seconds, by the way, the woman just, just shoots useless and talks about how dangerous Talon is. Cool. And then guess what? It cuts back to more flashbacks. Granted, these ones are much shorter, but they're still long compared to what flashbacks should be. And then it cuts back to the woman who just continues to threaten the man, and then guess what? More fucking flashbacks! This time, it's from four and five. Doesn't make it better, I'm just saying where they're from. And then it's revealed that the woman who we've been seeing this whole time threatening the useless kid from three killed Plank to get Talon's diary. Fucker, I loved Plank. He was a good man. He was the hero. Also, she just says it. There's not a flashback to that, because God forbid this movie film anything fucking new. Then we get 10 minutes from Curse of Puppet Master, which I just fucking watched. And then the guy, what, what did I call him? Oh yeah, useless. He just smacks the woman, takes her gun, which immediately sends us to yet another goddamn flashback. Why is this fucking movie? This flashback, if you were curious, is the puppets bringing Talon back to life in two, which I'll be honest, I forgot happened. And then the woman actually reveals her motivation for wanting the formula. She doesn't want it to bring puppets to life. It's actually because she wants to bring people back from the dead, which I suppose it does make more sense. And then guess what? 
more flashbacks to when Talon put himself into another body and then the puppets killed him, which is finally explained. See, who would have thought that apparently having your soul get trapped in a two foot tall immortal piece of wood was terrible and is also insanely painful. And that's why they killed Talon in two. So the woman is trying to figure out how to kill them. Um, did you miss the part where the farmer lady burned the leech one? How about that? Just try that. I feel like that would do a good job killing them, but maybe not. I don't know. So then the woman just dies and then the man fires a single bullet and I can't even say cut to credits because there are none. Yeah, no, if you can't tell by my voice, this is the worst one by far. This movie is an hour and 13 minutes long. You know how much of that time is flashbacks? An hour and three minutes. But this hour and 13 minute movie consists of maybe 10 minutes of new footage. Everything else was from movies that have already been made and that I've already watched. This movie is honestly a work of art. I cannot express to you how much I hated watching this. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention that instead of end credits, there's a thank you to the cast and crew of the previous movies, which makes sense because they did all the damn work. I'm done. Fuck it. I'm done. I'm sick of this. I'm done. I'm over it. <laughs> I don't want to talk about this movie at all. Next up. Uh, okay, whatever. So Puppet Master versus Demonic Toys is the long awaited crossover between Puppet Master and Full Moon Entertainment's other Killer Doll franchise, Demonic Toys, a horror film from 1992 that you guessed it, is about demonic toys. I've never seen it and I refuse to watch it. So let's just get this over with. Oh, would you look at that? It's a Christmas movie. This surely will go down as a Christmas classic, much like Christmas Evil and Fred Claus. Oh my God, is that Corey Feldman? What? How did they get Corey fucking Feldman? What is he wearing? You call that a wig? I call that a crime against my eyes. Also that voice. And besides for a cop, she was hot. Why? He sounds like he gargled nails. What is this? It hasn't even been five minutes and this is the most confused I've been the whole series. Okay, after collecting myself, Corey Feldman, who is somehow in this movie, is the great grandnephew of Talon and he has somehow managed to get his hands on Talon's diary and is making the formula with his daughter. I mean, it's better than if he wasn't around, but like not by much. Like at least she has a father figure. Although since it's Corey Feldman, she will more than likely become a murderer. So his daughter pricks him to get some blood and then asks, are we weird? Yes. Although Corey says no, I would still say yes, personally. The two of them then, I don't know, begin processing the formula. Then we see an animatronic ladybug that secretly has a camera in it. Cool. Now we're at Sharp Toys, which they really went with that. Sharp Toys. That must be a PR nightmare. We were then introduced to Miss Sharp and a generic catchman who are watching Corey and his daughter. Okay, I just want to interrupt this real quick and just say this movie has the best production value in the entire series. Like, I gotta say, the lighting, while still bad, is not as bad as other movies. And the set looks like the production team actually tried. Oh my god! S the six armed cowboy, what did they do to you? He looks hideous! I retract my statement about the production design. So Corey injects the green liquid into the six-armed cowboy and brings him back to life. They also then bring back redesigned Big Hands, who looks like he's made of clay now. Twisty Face, is that what I called him before? I, I don't know, whatever. The Jester, and then Blade, who was also redesigned. Why the fuck would you redesign Blade? Come on, he was the coolest one. So yeah, all the puppets just look so much worse than previous movies, like significantly worse. They are all hideous. I want to make a note about something Corey says here. He won't hurt you. As a matter of fact, they've been protecting the Talon family for generations, almost like guardian angels. Just gonna ignore the end of Puppet Master 2, huh? All right, movie, if you don't care, then I don't care. So the people at Sharp Toys then send people to steal the puppets. The puppets promptly beat the fuck out of them, but then the six-armed cowboy sadly causes a fire, which burns all the puppets, but thankfully, Corey is able to save them. A policewoman then shows up, and Corey tries to act. Tries being the keyword. Back at Sharp Toys, Ms. Sharp and the generic henchman take the receptionist, who looks like she's 13, down an elevator to meet the board of directors. She's gonna die, isn't she? What is this place? It's my own personal playroom. Yep, she's so dead. The poor receptionist is then motorboated by a baby doll. I honestly have nothing to say to that. I don't, I don't know. What would I even say? 
He then somehow convinces the policewoman to lie in her report. He then weirdly checks her out as she leaves. He then makes a bold claim that she was into him. I mean, with that hair, how could she not be? Whatever, back to Ms. Sharp's personal playroom. The toys are biting the receptionist. Like, they're not eating her, but they're just kind of gnawing at her. She reasonably asks for it to be over and instead gets put into an Iron Maiden. Her blood is then drained and Ms. Sharp makes a call out to a demon, of course. Oh my god, what the fuck is that? The haunted house I worked at when I was 18 had better effects than that. The psychosexual costumes look better than that. The demon and the sharp lady then argue over who gets Talon's blood and that the Talon family is gonna end. Please do, kill them all, I'm sick of these. Who am I supposed to be rooting for here? Corey Feldman or the demonic toys that wanna kill Corey? It's honestly a coin flip. Back in the Cory cave, the puppets alert Cory that there's a bug. The bug then explodes when Cory holds it. All right, Cory and his daughter then do some super hacking and discover that it was sharp, and then their computer just explodes. They then pack up the puppets and go to their grandmother's house, of course. Which, by the way, you never see her. Does she exist? Maybe. We then learn that the sharp lady's father sold his soul to make sharp toys as successful as it is. Cory then decides it's best if he goes into the Sharp Toys plant and tries to take them down. I I thought this was a Puppet Master movie. Why is Corey Feldman the one breaking into the plant? Why not just have the puppets do it? Oh, well, you see, they didn't do it because that would make sense, and God forbid this franchise make any bit of sense. Sharp Toys has released something called a Christmas Pal that I think is supposed to come alive. I think that's what their plan is. And the Sharp Lady is trying to make herself seem like a good philanthropist and donated a ton of toys. She even gets an award that's presented to her from the policewoman earlier. Meanwhile, Corey is snooping around and then gets chased by the motorboating baby. Corey then just yeets the baby into the henchman. Corey then runs through where the police lady is and he gets arrested. So after that, Corey goes back to the grandmother's house. Also, Corey decides to give Puppet some upgrades. The six armed cowboy gets some new guns. We then learn that Corey's daughter went through a phase where she listened to a band called Altar of Blood, which is somehow not a real band, actually. I looked it up. It's, it's not real, but that is an awesome name. I mean, you got Megadeth, Death, Lamb of God. No Altar of Blood, though. I mean, it's a good name. The policewoman does some breaking and entering to Corey's house and the motorboating baby, the bear and the clown are also there. They all try to attack her and she just shoots. She then leaves, but the baby is on the back of her car. Back with Corey and his daughter, they have an awkward conversation about if she's still a virgin. And then they bring all the puppets back with their upgrades. Big Hands explodes a pillow. Not plot relevant, but I thought it was cool. The policewoman then shows up at Corey's grandmother's house where she meets the puppets. The motorboating baby then calls the sharp lady and tells her where the puppets are. And now we get to the fight. You know, the whole point of this movie. It's in the name of the fucking movie, after all. Um, actually, no, we don't. Some henchmen come and kidnap Corey's daughter. And then I swear to God, I'm not making this up. The motorboating baby then farts with so much force, he is sent through the air and knocks Corey out with a single punch. I have no idea what to say to that. Corey then wakes up in the sharp lady's office. Meanwhile, Corey's daughter is being taken to the playroom that we saw earlier. The sharp lady then tries to seduce Corey, but before that happens, he gets the puppets awake. Can we just get to the fight now? You only called the damn movie Puppet Master vs. Demonic Toys. No, actually, because the sharp lady asked Corey to impregnate her. That is actually what she said, and like the man of God he is, Corey says no, and then is immediately punched in the dick. The sharp lady then takes another receptionist to meet the board of directors. The puppets escape, killing the people guarding Corey. The henchman brings in the clown who screams, causing the henchman's eyes to explode. All right, Corey and the puppets then make their way to the playroom. Meanwhile, in the playroom, the other receptionist is just thrown into the hole. The demon who is dressed as Santa this time uh, comes back and threatens Corey's daughter. But now it's time. The fight is here. Big Hands crushes the baby's head. He also loses an arm. Uh, Blade decapitates the bear. Jester throws the clown thing against a wall. And Corey fights a henchman. Bro, your daughter is dying. Actually try. Like, try to win this fight. But anyway, the sharp lady isn't able to drain Corey's daughter before the sunrise. So the demon takes her back to hell. And Corey saves his daughter. They won because the sun rose. Not because they actually won the fight. 10 out of 10 dad right there. So anyway, Corey and his daughter and the policewoman all walk out together in victory. And the policewoman invites them to Christmas dinner. Roll the fucking credits. I don't know what I expected, but it wasn't that. And I really wasn't a fan of it, to be honest. Next. All right, so Puppet Master 
Axis of Evil is the first part of what's known as the Axis Trilogy, and it is the ninth film to be released in the series. If you were wondering when this film takes place, it's sometime after Talon's Revenge, but according to Wikipedia, the film is set in 1941, but the title actually listed as 1939. To be honest, I stopped caring about the years in which these movies take place, because they get twisted pretty early, so I just kind of let the movies play out. But without any further ado, here's Poet Master, Axis of Evil. Well, we're back at the hotel again. Not even gonna get mad about it anymore. It's, it's not worth it. I'm pretty sure though, every time we see this hotel, it's just recycled footage from previous movies. Anyway, here we are in the basement of the hotel where Danny, I'm not even gonna try to make something funny with his name, he's just fucking Danny. Uh, Danny is making chairs for his uncle, the two start engaging in some back and forth, and eventually get on the subject of Andre Toulon, because of course, it wouldn't be a Puppet Master movie without him. Although of course it is not counting the ones he's not in. During their conversation, we learn a bit about Danny. Like, he wants to go over and kill Nazis, but he had polio as a kid, so he's unable to. Also, the uncle asks, now why would Nazis want to steal his puppets? Fair question. Danny then suggests that he could possibly work for Talon. Yeah, I'm sure nothing bad will come from that. Also, this film takes place in 1939, but they're talking about going over and fighting the Nazis. The US wouldn't enter World War II for another two to three years. I'm glad this franchise, whose lore is so dependent on World War II and the Nazis, knows about history. Oh look, my favorite, recycled footage. This time, it's from the first movie. So at least it's different this time. Now, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be a flashback. I don't, I don't think it is, because in the first one, this scene is set to take place in 1939, and the opening of this one's in 1939. But the things that Danny and his uncle are talking about don't occur until 1942, so I'm pretty sure they just didn't want to create new footage of Talon blowing his brains out. Either way, this use of recycled footage lasts about five minutes. Although, this time instead of jumping 50 years, we see what happened immediately afterwards, which includes one of the Nazi spies punching Danny in the face. Also, the difference in quality between the old and new footage is extremely noticeable. It's not subtle whatsoever. So Danny then finds that Talon has committed the unalive, and instead of calling for someone, he instead makes sure the puppets are okay. Also, thankfully, after the disaster redesign of the characters in Puppet Master vs. Demonic Toys, the puppets are thankfully back to the original looks. After that, we cut to the credits. Oh, so it's Charles Band's Puppet Master now, so he's the one I have to kill. So after the credits, we are sent to Danny's home, where we meet his very 1940s mother and his brother, Don. Danny and his family all live in Chinatown, and Danny's brother, being a 1940s man, says, what's the difference when asked about Chinese and Japanese? Well, you see, Don, the major difference is <laughs> the whole part about the ostrich is still up for a debate, even today, but I do hope that clears everything up. Danny, by the way, took the puppets home with him after finding them. You know, the more that people talk in this movie, it just sounds more insane. You're telling me Nazis came all the way for these puppets? Well, when you say it like that, it just sounds insane. Then Danny and his brother decide to party and leave their mother alone with the puppets. I'm sure that's gonna go well. We're like 20 minutes in now, and can I just say, having watched all of these, it feels like when they're going to make a new one of these, the first thing they try to figure out is how to use the puppets as little as possible. Anyway, the two Nazis who were after Talon visit a Japanese theater where they have a who can be more offensive to the nation they are representing competition. Like, I don't know if I can even comment on this without being canceled, but to recap, they decide for the Nazis to go undercover and look American, and they mention a secret plan. I don't know, the stereotyping in that scene was a little distracting, so I'm not sure what they even said. Danny is then cleaning the puppets, and he sees the hole in the back of their neck, and then the scene ends. Danny then goes to meet the love interest, Beth. We also meet Beth's boss, who is a massive dick, that's all. This character is a dick, that is his one defining character trait. After the terrible interaction, Danny, in frustration, kicks the puppet case, and an unknown puppet falls out of the hatch. Danny also finds the green liquid, and then without even questioning it, he just injects it into Jester. I mean, Danny seems smart, so I imagine he could have figured it out, but it took him like 10 seconds. His reaction to giving life to puppets is rather tame and just says, wow, you are alive, rather than, oh my god, what the fuck is that? He also decides that bringing the Jester to Beth is a good idea. What the fuck is wrong with this man? But before he can see Beth, he sees her laughing with one of the Nazis, Danny then confronts her, telling her that it was a Nazi, to which she doesn't believe him. Danny then decides to follow him around like a rational person. Hey, remember when this series was about puppets? Yeah, me either, because despite this series being called Puppet Master, this series is always about useless fucking humans, and I just want to see puppets killing people. Granted, I've gotten it, but I wanted more! I expected more child's play, and all I'm getting is the fucking notebook! 
So Danny follows the Nazi to the Japanese theater and overhears them discussing their plans. Danny then lets the puppets loose, and Big Hand steals a part of the blueprints the Nazis stole, and then Blade stabs him. Good Blade. Good boy. What the hell is wrong with me? So after that, Danny gets back and discovers what the plan is. His brother then comes home drunk and talks about boobs. Fair enough, boobs are awesome. Danny talks to the puppets, or at least communicates with them, and then they all agree to try and stop the plan to blow up the plant where Beth works. The plant, by the way, is just called that. It's never explained what they do there, just that it's important and it might get blown up. Also, when Beth sees the puppets, she is way too calm. In fact, everyone that has ever seen these puppets has always acted way too cool about it. Like, the puppets are alive. That is fucking weird, and people are acting like it's normal. It is not. Like, show some kind of emotion about it, please. The Nazi and the Japanese have a tense conversation about music. Yeah, no, that, that's it. That's all it is. While getting ready for a party, one of the Nazis comes and kills Danny's mom which he discovers after he gets back from investigating the theater some more. He then, I think, cries? I don't know. The acting is very bad. Oh, and his brother is shot, and Beth gets kidnapped. Again, I think it's supposed to be emotional, but the acting here is very, very bad. Danny then gets the brilliant idea to infuse his brother's blood into the green liquid, and then puts him into the mysterious puppet that came out of the hatch earlier. Beth, meanwhile, is kidnapped, and the Nazi tries to defend Beth from the Japanese guys, and the Kabuki lady says that the Nazis are weak because they have feelings for Beth. The Nazis then haunt her, and I am just very uncomfortable. Oh god, leech woman! So while Danny and the puppets try breaking into the theater, Beth shit talks on the Nazis. She's my favorite character, not just in this movie, just the whole series. Yes, even more than Plank. While I do love me some Plank, look at her. Beth is Beth is great. Uh, Big Hands and Drillhead then attack and kill one of the Japanese guys, and then the one Nazi dude gets into a suit. You know, for a movie that's only an hour and 21 minutes, it feels like it's never ending. So the puppet of Danny's brother breaks Beth out of her ties, and then he throws a ninja star at the Nazi's head. Jesus. I love that, actually. When Danny's brother tries to take out the Kabuki lady, she just kills him. All right, glad we went through all that to bring his brother back just for him to die again never mind he's he's back also blade is a bomb who gave that puppet a bomb also they're talking about the attack on pearl harbor which happened in 1941 title at the beginning says 1939 you can't just mess with that kind of thing whoever wrote this movie is a fucking idiot oh yeah that guy fuck him but danny's brother then kills the last remaining nazi and then dies for real oh well and the kabuki lady runs away with all the puppets except for danny's brother blade and big hands a sequel is teased cut to credits it's over i'll be honest that was wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. It surely wasn't good, but I actually don't hate myself for watching it, or at least not as much as I did for watching the other ones. Eh, it's alright, next. Puppet Master X, Axis Rising. Look, they went back the numbers. They just wanted to put the X in the title, didn't they? So this picks up pretty much immediately after the events of the last one. We see the same, but also recasted, Kabuki Lady running down a dark alley, where she runs into some Nazis. So one of the Nazis takes the bag that the lady had, and then Drillhead does what he does best, to which the reactions range from shock to whatever this face is. Although to be fair, I don't think I'd know how to react either. Oh, and then a Nazi dude just kills her, and then implies necrophilia, and I'm uncomfortable again, something that is becoming increasingly common with these movies. After whatever the hell that opening scene was, we cut to the opening credits. Wait, what the fuck? Nigel McGuinness is in this? Like the wrestler. Oh my god, he is. UK wrestling legend Nigel McGuinness is in this movie. I don't know if I should be excited or scared by that. Okay, so after that bombshell of information, we... Who the fuck is that? That is not Danny. And that is certainly not Beth. Who are these people? Okay, so I looked it up, and no one from the last movie is in this. You got UK wrestling legend Nigel McGuinness, but you couldn't get the guy who starred in the last one to come back. Alright, you know, I don't have a lot of faith in this one. The recasting of literally everyone has not helped. Okay, let's just get this over with. Oh my god, the guy playing Danny is a worse actor than the guy I called Plank. This acting is like watching a college short film. I should know. I've made several. Ah yes, Blade, here to save the movie. Thank god they at least kept the best actor. Although, I think he's seen better days. This is like watching Planks of Wood try to play charades. So after whatever that was, we see a totally not suspicious man go into a totally not suspicious lab, and guess what? He likes destroying baby dolls. Yeah, I didn't expect that one either. Hot Nazi! What the fuck? Listen, this woman is very attractive, but one, what the fuck is this uniform? And two, why a hot Nazi? Look at this shot and tell me this doesn't look like it's from an edgy porn. Like, that's the only vibe I'm getting from this. So the hot Nazi is just being a bitch to this old man for no reason, but she's a Nazi, so I guess her being 
being a bitch shouldn't be that unexpected. So the hot Nazi promises to give the old man a surprise if he does a good job. And by surprise the man, she means, you know, sex. The Nazi that killed the lady earlier, whose name I think is Morbius, is back, then threatens the old man, just straight up with death, if he doesn't do whatever he is supposed to be doing. So not Danny, and very much not Beth, get taken by the US Army, and Major Payne tells them that they know about the plot to blow up the plant, and he commands them. Danny continues to proclaim that he needs to enlist, but Payne says it's not about the uniform, it's about the soldier's spirit. What? Okay, so the old man is actually working on a resurrection machine, so Morbius kills the Japanese man because in order for a resurrection machine to work, the subject must already be dead. You know what? Fair enough. Then they test the machine and the man is alive again. Yay! Oh, no, he's dead. Morbius then yells at the old man and shows the old man Drillhead. Fair enough! Drillhead is pretty dangerous. He also pulls a gun on him. We cut back to the aftermath of not Danny telling Major Payne the story of the last movie, and Payne just believes him, I guess. Like, they don't even have to try and convince him. He just believes them. He then invites them to a secret dinner gathering thing for a general, and then kicks him out. Hot Nazi! Yeah, so the hot Nazi is trying to seduce Morbius, and then gets upset when he doesn't seem interested. Listen, I wouldn't be proud of it, but come on, come on. Okay, so after being rejected, she then insults him for being obsessed with Nazis and magic. Both things are worth insulting, to be honest. Morbius then yells at her, she likes it, and then they fuck, except they don't. They get interrupted by a messenger with a message, obviously. The message is about the secret dinner that we learned about earlier. Morbius decides I need to kill the general, resurrect him, and use him against the US. Bold plan, I gotta say. Not Danny and Beth arrive back at a home that is not the house from the last movie, with a sergeant who I'm guessing was told to watch them. Guess what? The sergeant, he's a dick. What a twist. By the way, we're 40 minutes into this one, and there's been one kill by a puppet, and it was in the first two minutes. We haven't even seen a puppet that wasn't Drillhead since the first five minutes. What's this movie called again? Right. Oh my god, this dinner scene is still going. Holy shit, it's the puppets, finally! We once again are sent back to the totally not suspicious secret lab, where the old man is looking inside of Drillhead. Hot Nazi! The old man then extracts the green liquid out of Drillhead, and then the hot Nazi kisses him for his efforts. Morbius then walks in on them and kills the hot Nazi. Damn, the one redeeming thing about this movie was just killed. The old man then weirdly coddles her dead body. That's... Uh, ah. Back at Not the House from the last movie, the crew all gear up with all the puppets, and once again we are back in the totally not suspicious secret lab where the old man is working on his resurrection machine to bring back the hot Nazi, of course. Also, when he flips the switch for the machine, it legit looks like he just did random bullshit on the switchboard. So he brings her back to life for like five seconds, maybe, and then she just rots away. Also, her eyes move. I don't know if that was part of the script or it's just bad filmmaking. So after the old man fails once again, he decides to go back to the drawing board, this time swearing he won't fail. We shall see. Morbius then arrives and sees what the old man did to the hot Nazi's body and then yells at him, which the old man responds by bringing a puppet called Bob bombshell to life? Okay. Also, Bombshell fires bullets from her chest because of course she does. Although she unfortunately has the aim of a stormtrooper. It was at this point that I realized I was about an hour in and so very much just wanted to be doing anything else other than watching this movie. Not Danny, Beth, and Sarge are outside of the Not Suspicious Secret Lab and get fired on by Bombshell. Sadly, Big Hands is struck down and sadly perishes. He's died a couple of times, but like beast that he is, he comes back. Again, the old man then gives life to a tank boy and a werewolf. I have no idea how a werewolf connects to the Nazis, but here we go. Have I mentioned how much I hate the new leads in this movie? If I haven't, I hate them so much. How dare you stand where they stood? Actually, they aren't even standing where they stood because it's a different set. Anyway, not Danny and Beth are given medals of bravery for their actions in the last movie. No, it wasn't them. It was the real Danny and Beth, not you imposters. Actually, no, not Danny declines the medal and says he just wants to enlist. Then out of nowhere, Tank Boy and Bombshell arrive and just start shooting up the place. So like the fucking beast that he is, Blade comes down and fights the werewolf while Leech Woman fights Bombshell and Big Hands does attempt but ultimately fails to take down the tank boy. But the puppets are able to win and out of gratitude, the general tells not Danny that he has earned his way into the army. That is not at all how that works. After all that, the gang is back at the fake house. They reveal that the six armed cowboy is coming back, which is great. Morbius is still upset with the old man because the machine doesn't work and the old man tells him that he needs magic for it to work. Blade and 
and the Leech Woman then work together to take down a Nazi guard, and then Sarge takes out the other. They are then able to enter the not suspicious lab, and once again, the puppets fight. The old man tries to escape, but is stopped by Not Beth. The six armed cowboy kills Bombshell. Morbius kills Sarge. Blade kills Morbius. And the old man refuses to try to resurrect him. Then an extremely racist puppet named Kamikaze then just blows up the lab. Not Beth then convinces Not Danny to let the old man go free instead of turning him into the army. So they were heroes. Now they're traitors. Amazing. Also, the old man still has some of their green liquid. That's it. It's over. That was just bad. Like, really bad. They recasted everyone and perhaps their greatest sin of all. It was so boring. I legitimately almost fell asleep watching this, and I also had to take a break in the middle. My god, this movie was painful to get through. I just, you know what, whatever, let's go to the next one. Well, we have reached the end of the Axis Trilogy. There was actually a five-year gap in between this and Rising, so I guess for people of the franchise, they had to wait all that time to figure out what would happen next. For me, it's just moving one over in the recommended section on Tubi. Okay, so let's see if this trilogy goes off with a bang or a bunch of nothing. Knowing the series, I'll be asleep in 10 minutes. Set in 1942, the film opens up with a greenlit safe house, and oh my god, not Danny and Beth just die right away. I'm actually not even mad because they weren't even Danny and Beth, but what a way to start off. I mean, imagine waiting five years for this, and that's just how it opens up. They just die. Jesus Christ, if I actually cared, I might be upset. But personally, I'm happy that they're dead. Also, I guess that means that once again, the puppets have a new master. They've had like six at this point, so you know what, what's one more? After the credits, we see a random receptionist who looks more like Beth than the girl they recast her with. We then see Brooks make eye contact with a man who is clearly not writing anything, and then he is called into the office. I love the dedication of the guy playing Brooks, by the way. He's so intense. The man that Brooks made eye contact with outside is then brought into the office, and he turns out to be Dr. Ivan Ivanov. That's really the name they went with. Brooks is told that the Nazi puppets have killed several Americans and that he is now to work with Ivan. Alright! We then see some Nazis talking about someone dying. I'm pretty sure it's the old man from the last one. I don't really know. Jesus! Her stare is very intense. Why is this movie so intense? It's the 11th Puppet Master. There's no need to act this intensely. Okay, never mind. I take it back. Go back to acting intensely. It's better than whatever this is. Oh, well, those guys are both dead. Cool. Blade then scares Ivan's daughter, and she's right confused about it. She then meets Brooks, and whose response to seeing her definitely tells me that he wants to fuck her. We also meet Georgina Vale, a witch who specializes in sexual magic, because of course she does, and whose body language, to me, says that she would like to fuck Brooks. And to be honest, nothing of interest is said during this scene. I'm sorry, like, I don't have much to say, but there's nothing worth bringing up. The two Nazis from earlier then torture a guy, while three others play cards, another one reads, also, that one kind of looks like Stephen King. I'm really struggling to say things about this movie. This movie is supposed to take place in 1942, but the houses they've shown are all new. Like, nothing like they were in 1942. These are all modern day houses. Back at Ivan's house, Vale is naked, and Ivan and his daughter are reading a scroll. Brooks is there. Nothing is happening. Oh my god. We are 30 minutes in, and this is by far the worst one. Even worse than Legacy. While that was mostly flashbacks, things were still happening. Nothing's happening here. Oh, would you look at that? A sex scene. Oh my god, what the fuck was that? Oh, and Blade is still watching Ivan's daughter. Which is weird, right? I'm not crazy. It's weird. Ivan's daughter then explains she had a dream about Brooks that pretty much is just exposition about his backstory. Ivan's daughter then explains her own backstory. None of this, by the way, is interesting. Yeah. Oh, uh... Shit, uh, Brooks, Ivan, and his daughter then come face to face with a Stephen King lookalike who threatens to turn them all into puppets. Again, none of this is interesting or fun to watch. I'm gonna- I'm gonna go back to sleep. Oh shit! Uh, the six-armed cowboy then kills a Nazi and Big Hands tries choking the lady Nazi, but is taken down by the syringe lady. This movie is like watching snails race. It's kind of interesting for a few seconds here and there, but my god is it slow. The leech woman then throws up a leech onto the eye of the Stephen King lookalike, whose response is to electrify his face. Good idea. He lives, by the way. <laughs> 
I give up. I can't do it. I can't finish it. I'm done. I'm so sick of this movie. I, I can't take any more of this. This is by far the worst one. I know I joked about the intensity of the acting with characters like Brooks, but oh my god. The acting is just bad. The writing is dog shit. The editing, the lighting, everything about this movie is terrible, and I'm I can't do this anymore. I'm not I'm not I'm not doing it. I'm not finishing this one. I can't. I'm done. I don't care. Whatever. Just go to the next one. Okay. Puppet Master, The Littlest Reich. Just one year after Axis Termination, we got this reboot set in an alternate timeline, meaning that none of the previous films matter, and it's a fresh start for the puppets and the character of Andre Talon. The puppets who have been moved around and redesigned to the point where it's pointless to try and piece it together kind of had nowhere to go, while 4 and 5 went in the direction of making the puppets no longer raging murderers who killed at random. It, it gave them a sense of purpose in fighting a demon and helping Rick. All of that, of course, was undone in Legacy, where we were told that Rick was killed by the mercenary and the puppets were now left with no master. The Axis trilogy did nothing but make the very early part of the timeline even more convoluted and hurt the puppets by not showcasing them at all except for very small fight scenes. All of that, along with a lackluster story and terrible filmmaking, these puppets like Blade and Pinhead have sadly become nothing more than throwaway characters in their own franchise. Going into this series, I thought, since Blade was on every poster, that he was like the mastermind or a very important part of the story, but instead was nothing more than a prop and a marketing tool. So that was kind of a long rant, but, but this one is a 5.4 on IMDb, meaning it's one of the highest rated in the franchise, and this time around, I don't have to worry about keeping track of a convoluted timeline. So let's see what this reboot has to offer. The first thing I want to mention about this movie was that it was actually not made by Full Moon Entertainment. It was actually released by Fangoria, and it's also feature length rated right around 90 minutes, which is actually quite the accomplishment for this franchise. Okay, so unlike the other films, this takes place in Texas and not California, and it's also, so far, shot like an actual movie. So this version of Andre Talon walks into a bar and asks for soda water with lemon. Kind of basic, but you know, pretty standard bar drink. He goes to hand the bartender a big bill, and the bartender asked if he has anything smaller, to which he says, All my bills are that size. Which I'm pretty sure they are inferring something. She catches the bill, and then the two engage in some very natural conversation. I would also like to say that the prosthetics on the guy playing Talon's face are bad. There's no way around that. They're, they're just bad. So Talon then asks a girl sitting at the bar if she's acquainted with the bartender. In response to that question, they make out in front of him. He doesn't seem to like that though, so he leaves. Later on, the two girls are driving and start discussing the possibilities of having a baby. One of them is gonna die. Oh god, that's horrific. This is the best one. Already, it's the best one. I love it. Talon then calls to the puppets for them to run and meet him in the basement, but after that horrific murder of the two women, two police officers come across the car and see tiny footprints. One of them says it was probably a raccoon. I'm gonna have to disagree with that. The police officer somehow end up at Talon's house where they just shoot him and we get the title card. Holy shit, what a way to start. I got to say, I'm actually pretty intrigued. I I can't lie. That was a hell of an opening. So for this movie, the opening credits are actually played over some artwork that kind of explained Talon's backstory. It's pr pretty cool. I, I can't really lie. And the music is thankfully not the Puppet Master theme. I'm not sure what it is, but whatever it is, it is so much better than the Puppet Master theme. Oh, and one other thing. If you couldn't tell, Talon is actually a bad guy in this. Well, more than he was in the originals, you know, for creating the puppets. But in this one, instead of fighting Nazis, he was a Nazi and use the puppets to hunt down enemies of the state. I'm not going to say anything specific because I don't need the algorithm to hate me more than it already does. But okay, moving on. So we cut to present day Texas, where we meet Edgar, who goes to see his parents, and guess what? His dad's a dick! Who would have thought? Also, I know that this whole series is categorized as horror comedy, but this is the first one that is legit just telling jokes. So Edgar goes through an old box and finds a newly redesigned blade. To be honest, I don't hate the redesign. It's a bit more gritty compared to the old design, which was a bit more cartoonish. So as it turns out, Edgar actually works at a comic book store and actually makes some of his own. Wait, what the fuck? Nelson Franklin? What? Why is he in this? That dude's like an actual actor. He's been in an Edgar Wright movie. Why is he in this? So when Edgar arrives back at his parents' house, he gets a visit from an old friend named Ashley. The two of them go on a very awkward walk, and then he returns home, and he sees an ad for a Talon auction, and finds the Blade doll, which promptly cuts him. Now in this one, Blade actually has hands, and they open up to reveal the hook and Blade rather than those just being his hands. Which I'll be honest, is a redesign I can get behind. He then tells Blade not to stab anything. Good luck with that one. He also learns that it was his brothers who just randomly found it. Okay. 
While at work, he does some digging to learn about Postville, where his brother found the doll, and then Ashley walks in. Oh, they're dating, by the way. It was never said, but she walks up and kisses him. So unless they're just like really good friends, I'm going to assume they're dating. Do people kiss their friends? I don't have friends. Edgar then invites Ashley to the Talon auctions. Nelson then invites himself. So the gang heads off to the auction, and when they check in, the guy is just casually being anti-Semitic to Nelson Franklin. Uh, what names are your reservations under? Uh, there's two. One's under uh, Easton, one's under Markowitz. You must be Markowitz. Why? Because I look like a Jew. Are you Markowitz? Yes. There's nothing to be upset about now, is there? That's not cool, man. Not cool. You know what is cool? Sex. Which Edgar and Ashley have. After that, the gang goes to the Talon Mansion for a tour being given by the Lady Cop from the beginning. So during this tour, we learn a few things about this version of Talon. We first learn that the puppetry was a family business and that fled to Germany and joined the Reich. Just weeks before the war ended, he began sending gold to the US, and then when the war was over, he fled to the US with his wife Madeline, not Elsa. Sadly, on the way to the US, Madeline would jump from the ship, killing herself. It's also revealed that Talon kidnapped, tortured Jewish women. What the fuck? So the about face for Talon's character from anti-Nazi and escaping the right to full-blown Nazi fanatic is quite startling, especially having seen the other films. It's also revealed that Talon made a shit ton of puppets, and specifically, 60 of them will be in one location. That'll be fine, I'm sure. So after the tour, Edgar and Ashley immediately start going at it again until they discover that the box the Blade was in is empty. In another room, when a couple returns, they find Torch escaped his box, and then he kills them. Listen, is it tragic that this couple died? Yes. However, it's great to see Torch back. We then go to another couple about to have sex, but sadly for them, Blade slices the man's Achilles heel and then stabs the hell out of the woman, none of which I can show you because boobs. We then cut to a wrestling reference that has aged worse than the original movie. So the guy who is watching wrestling goes to pee and gets his throat cut and then his head cut off by another puppet and this one flies. And yes, he does pee on his own head. This movie is insane and I love it. Now we see Nelson at the bar and he tries to order a drink for a girl, but that plan quickly is thwarted by her drinking tea. He then buys her some tea instead, but she still rejects him. Nelson also befriended the bartender whose name is legitimately Cuddly Bear. Fantastic. So the Police show up and then we learn that the other puppets have gone missing, but of course we know that they're coming alive, they're not actually going missing. A dude talking to his mom and lying about being sober is then killed by a blade lookalike. A woman is killed in a bathtub and discovered by a woman who I believe is her lover. This death kind of irks me because it was made to look like a suicide. A pregnant woman is then killed by a puppet crawling into her and breaking out alien style, which is just absolutely horrific and kind of amazing. Edgar then finds the guy who was peeing on his own face when he died and is able to piece together that the people who have been killed have been gypsies, Jewish, and or gay. Nazis hated all those people, so it's not hard to put the pieces together, unless you're the cop. In that case, you're a fucking idiot. In Nelson's room, he's talking to a girl when they notice a different blade puppet, then it just disappears. An interracial couple is then murdered, and then the guy is turned into a puppet. This movie has been insane so far, and I love it. The police then gather everyone into a single room. I'm sure nothing bad's gonna happen. Okay, this part is actually a little annoying. The investigator becomes unreasonable. He's not letting anyone leave the building, despite there being multiple murders. I'm pretty sure if there's even one murder the floor it happens on, at minimum, is evacuated. So an investigator openly stating that no one's allowed to leave is just stupid, and even locking the doors is just insane. I mean, I know why this is happening. It's of course so there can be more puppet murder, but it's still a huge jump in logic, even if it is a killer doll movie. Anyway, the power goes out and the crowd starts to panic and the lady cop tour guide fires off some warning shots. They're indoors, so of course. Then everyone just kind of leaves the building anyway, but the gate is actually locked to the parking lot so no one can leave. And then a woman's torso is cut open by the flying puppet we saw earlier. No one seems to notice though. A woman then gets into her car and Pinhead then opens the back of the woman's head. The body double is a tad noticeable, but I do appreciate the practical effects. There's these two stoner characters, and when they get into their car, the one gets killed by the one that looks like Blade but isn't Blade. The gang, however, was smart and didn't leave the hotel, so they're still alive, at least for now. Back outside, Cuddly Bear sees a kid whose parent was killed, so he helps him, until the flying puppet just eviscerates the kid. All the survivors then gather in the bar and try to come up with a plan. 
Edgar then explains everything, then Nelson offers himself up as bait so they can catch one of the puppets. While guarding Nelson, the lady cop tour guide just gets wrecked when something is thrown through the window. It's kind of funny. Another cop who goes to check on her gets his arm ripped off by Pinhead, but they are able to capture a puppet. The guy that was turned into a puppet then kills a cop and starts shooting at the survivors, killing a maid and wounding the investigator. Also, the puppet that was inside of the guy was a baby with Hitler's head. I'm not joking. Nelson then throws that one into an oven. I, I, I see what you did there. God. I'm applauding you, movie. That was a good one. Pinhead and another puppet are then shot, and some others are in pursuit of the survivors. Hey, and Torch also shows up. The lady cop tour guide then says for everyone to find a room and hide. I'm sure that will not backfire in any way. The main group is searching for a place to hide when they come across a bunch of dead bodies before eventually setting on a room to hide out in. Then they hear a girl calling out, so Edgar and Nelson go to sea and they come across a dead woman who is being jumped on by a pogo puppet. What? The two then rush back to the room, but they are ambushed by Pinhead and another puppet. Nelson is punched in the face, and then sadly, Blade breaks through the ceiling and kills Nelson. While they are trying to escape, the girl that Nelson had made friends with also dies. Edgar then kills a puppet, and then he and Ashley steal a truck and escape the hotel. The lady cop tour guide is then killed. Cuddly Bear is attacked, but he's able to escape, but Howie does die. Edgar and Ashley then drive the truck into the mausoleum, which stops the puppet's murderous rampage. They do, however, have to fight a zombified Talon, who very unfortunately kills Ashley with a bullet to the head. The zombified Talon then escapes into the woods. It then ends with Edgar having written a new comic book, clearly inspired by the events that just took place, and a to-be-continued graphic pops up, and then the movie ends. Okay, so I'll be honest, I knew nothing about this other than that it was an alternate timeline, so it didn't have any connection to the others. But I'll be completely honest, I love that. It was everything I wanted the others to be. You call a movie Puppet Master, and this is what I would expect. Murderous puppets, just complete and utter carnage. Was the acting cheesy? Yes. Was the script perfect? Not even close. But it was a fun killer doll movie. This is the only movie from this series that I can safely say that I recommend you watch. It's stupid, but it's the best kind of stupid. It's just fun to watch. I somehow really enjoyed this one. This one, however, is not on Tubi. I did, however, find it on YouTube. I have no idea how it's still on YouTube considering what's in it, but if you're able to still find it, I definitely say to check it out. Unfortunately, we are back to the old timeline with the next one, Blade the Iron Cross. I don't want to watch this movie if I'm being honest. I really don't. Whatever. I'm almost done. Let's just get this over with. Next. Well, after the fun that was The Little Strike, we are once again back in the time of the Axis trilogy. I could not be more depressed about it. I don't want to do this. I hated that trilogy. I couldn't even finish the last one. Well, at least there's a new company producing them now. Oh, fucking kill me. Yeah, so Full Moon is responsible for this one, not Fangoria. I, I don't want to do this. I, d I don't want to watch it. I don't want to. I'd rather do Bulgarian split squats. Fine, I'll do it. I'm gonna need help getting through this. This is Blade the Iron Cross. If I'm being honest, seeing the full moon logo again hurts. So the film starts off with Eliza, played by the same girl from Termination, shockingly, being shown flashbacks. I mean, having a nightmare, vision, whatever, of previous events, and then she writes a letter to her father, Ivan Ivanov, which is still a stupidly Russian name. Uh, in this nightmare, vision, whatever, she sees Blade. When she is done writing the letter, she then burns it, and it unleashes some green smoke. Whatever you do, don't take a deep breath. Also, once again, Blade is redesigned, and he just looks... he just looks bad. I'm sorry. Hey, guess what? There's a Nazi scientist in a lab. Who would have guessed? They are experimenting with the green liquid that Talon made. These movies are just a big fucking circle. There's no progression. It just goes back to where we were before. Every movie has a scientist trying to figure out what the green liquid is, and every time, they can't figure it out. What a fucking shock! Anyway, a dude threatens to kill an official, but then, while trying to escape, he's eaten by a zombie. Okay, so there's zombies now. Cool! During a b-roll transition, we then see a modern-day California. Keep in mind, this movie takes place in 1945. So at Eliza's work, we find out that she's a reporter who reports things. That's her boss. He's like a mix of that guy from How to Drink mixed with the epic voice guy. And then those two are just very horny. But her boss says that murder isn't a headline. I'm pretty sure that's all headlines are, sir. 
Eliza then takes the guy and investigates the guy that was killed by the zombie. While doing the investigation, they are interrupted by some police, and the one is doing an accent. I'm not sure what accent, but it's not one you would hear in California. He also threatens to beat Eliza, truly a man who swore to serve and protect. A lieutenant then arrives, and the music turns into a wannabe noir soundtrack for some reason. Eliza and the guy are then taken in for questioning, except that the guy is free to just leave when he asks politely, and then the lieutenant tries tries to flirt with Eliza, and it somehow works since she just kisses him. Like a true reporter, she does anything for a story. Now we see Eliza being stalked while she's washing her hair. It's the cop that threatened to beat her, actually. And then Eliza flirts with Blade, like, a little bit too much. And then there's a weird fade to black, and then it comes back to see Eliza then seductively sharpening Blade's blades. Why is this so sexual? He's a Nazi doctor in a puppet's body. What is this? Oh, and after she sharpens that blade, she actually cuts herself and bleeds onto her chest. The cop who was stalking her then goes to snitch on her to a man in black. So as it appears, this cop is a traitor. I doubt he lives to the end of the movie. Eliza and Blade are like mentally connected now somehow like it's, it's not explained it's just it just kind of happens but Blade uh, breaks into the factory where the dirty cop is and during all of this Eliza is just in her bed convulsing so that's cool the dirty cop then calls Blade Pinocchio which how dare you sir but don't worry the cop's dead he's he's very dead now actually two stooges for the nazi doctor come across the dead cop but have like no reaction whatsoever once again we see a modern day california in 1945 the lieutenant then finds his way to a secret nazi clubhouse and fights and kills a zombie he's also so cool that he never loses his toothpick no matter what Back at Eliza's work, the camera guy shows her the pictures he took and is then sent on a mission to go to Eliza's apartment. While there, the two horny co-workers decide to do it on Eliza's bed, which is just disrespectful. Sadly though, before anything can happen, the girl pulls out a knife and cuts her chest and then shoves the guy's face into it. What? She put on a scent before and it knocks him out and then some other guys show up, take the guy away, and then we learn that she wants Blade. Blade, however, actually leaps out the window and so he gets away. Also, the photos that the guy took that are in the dark room, they're destroyed and then the lieutenant then tells Eliza that the guy was taken while still flirting with her somehow. The other reporters at Eliza's work then fall asleep because I guess they were sick of this movie and then Eliza and the lieutenant also fall over and then many gas masks then arrive and take both of them to warehouse but a warehouse since that's all these prequel films are now they're just films in warehouses that's actually that's a fact you can look that up they were legitimately filmed in, in warehouses <laughs> Uh, the lieutenant is then awoken by the camera guy screaming, and Eliza is just fucking naked, strapped to a chair. Like, she's completely naked. Like, this poor girl, man. Like, she's just sitting there. Why is she fully naked? Why? <laughs> oh, by the way, um, if you cared, now there's a Nazi death ray plot. Then this one dude just gives a ton of unprompted exposition, and then Eliza is threatened to give up the secret of Talon's liquid. When she refuses, she is electrocuted. None of this I can show you, by the way. You, you know, cause, um, she's naked. And it's then revealed that her waveform is special? I don't know what that means. Uh, but she then uses her bio energy to control Blade, who cuts the lieutenant loose. Blade then begins hunting, but also taunting the Nazis. The lieutenant also takes some of them out. The main Nazi dude then unleashes the zombies. Nazi zombies. I, 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 I see what you did there, movie. The Nazi official dude then gets eaten eaten by a zombie but he also sounds like he's getting off as it happens i thought this was about puppets and it's just become a fucking wannabe nazi zombies blade cuts eliza loose this poor girl finally gets some clothes on and since eliza and blade have a connection when blade's head is shoved into a furnace she feels it eliza then gives a rousing and motivational speech blade is just then fucking obliterated with a sledgehammer by the nazi scientist blade then just re-emerges somehow from the nazi's body and he's completely fine uh, not, not a scratch on him, actually. It's then revealed that if the Nazi scientist were to die, then the death ray would go off, so Eliza and the lieutenant have to figure out how to stop that from happening. The two of them just say, fuck it, and decide to blow up the building instead, with Blade, of course, getting to do the honors, since, you know, it's his movie. So the death ray is destroyed, and Eliza writes an article about it, and it gets printed. Eliza writes her father one final letter, and then Blade kills the man in black from earlier, and then the movie ends. That actually wasn't 
too bad. It was only an hour and 10 minutes, so it went by decently fast compared to some of the others. It was much better than any of the Axis trilogy. I would have liked to see Blade kill more people, but that's an issue I've been griping about since the beginning, so I won't harp on it too much here. Uh, overall, it's a very middle of the road movie. All my complaints about the others fit in here too. Uh, mediocre writing, bad acting, bad production design. You know, the sets were bad, but like, I'm kind of numb to that stuff now, so it's, I, I don't care. It's whatever. Thankfully, it's over. So let's, uh, we got one more. Let's do this. Okay, so this one actually isn't out yet. The Wikipedia page says it comes out this year, and to be honest, I thought it already had come out, but you know what? I'm happy I don't have to watch another one of these things. Next. Wait. Yep. We're not done yet. We got one more video. Hey everyone, I'm Maker and welcome back. Throughout this series, I've said where each film lies within the timeline, so I thought I would do my best to try and elaborate or explain it just a little bit more. I can't promise you it'll make sense, but none of the series has made any sense anyway, so fuck it! Also, yes, I am still ranking them. I haven't forgotten about it. That will come at the end after I explain the timeline. So, let's get into it. Alright, first movie in the series, Retro Puppet Master. Haven't seen it, but it takes place in 1902, so no shit it's first. Next, Dr. Death. It's not out yet, but he's a character from Retro, so I'm gonna assume that it goes here. Next, Puppet Master 3, Talon's Revenge. The film takes place in 1941, despite Talon dying in 1939. It doesn't make any sense, and I refuse to think about it anymore. Next, Puppet Master, Axis of Evil. Where the film lies is actually pretty confusing because the film itself states it takes place in 1939 after Talon dies, despite talking about events that happened in Talon's Revenge, and also real-life historical events that take place in 1941 through 1943, despite taking place in 1939. None of it makes any sense. I don't care anymore. Next! Puppet Master X, Axis Rising, takes place directly after Axis of Evil. Next, Axis Termination, this takes place one year after Axis Rising. Next, Blade the Iron Cross, takes place a few years after Termination, following Ivanov's daughter and Blade investigating a death ray that turns people into zombies. What the fuck? Next, the original Puppet Master, uh, first released, but the eighth, I can't think of anything that rhymes with released. Whatever, it's eighth in the timeline. Curse of the Puppet Master. Despite being a standalone movie with no connections to any other films, it takes place in between 1 and 2 because fuck you. Puppet Master 2 takes place after Curse and sometime after the events of the first one since the people in this movie are investigating the killings from the first one. Cool. Puppet Master 4. A few years after 2, this one happens. Puppet Master 5, the final chapter. It takes place immediately after 4. Puppet Master, the legacy. Takes place sometime after the final chapter, and it is the last one in this timeline. It also kills Plank off screen. I haven't forgotten about that, and I will still never forgive it for that. Next, Puppet Master vs. Demonic Toys. I'm pretty sure this one takes place in the Demonic Toys timeline. I honestly don't know. It doesn't fit anywhere in the Puppet Master timeline, so I'm just gonna assume that it's in the Demonic Toys timeline. Alright, cool. No one cares? Cool. Puppet Master The Little Strike, alternate timeline so it's unrelated to any of the other films? Good! Because this movie is better than all of them and shouldn't be classified with them. This franchise has balls of fucking steel to think it has earned the right to be this stupid and convoluted. The Nazi thing, while it's kind of there in the first one, and by kinda I mean if you don't read the Wikipedia page, never know, it just left hooks you in the later films. I hate this franchise and I'm furious that it has stolen nearly 20 hours of my life that I can and will never get back. Fuck this franchise, I hate it more than my ex-girlfriend and she cheated on me. I hate everything about these movies. I hate the puppets, not just because some of them are Nazis. Don't think I forgot about Blade being a fucking Nazi doctor, but because they had the audacity to stretch this fucking franchise for 15 movies. Who's watching these? I know that I watched them, but I did that for this video. Who else is watching these? Who watches these movies for pleasure? I want to know. I want names. I will kill them all. I will kill all of them because they are the reason that there are 15 of these. I will end all- Not the little strike though. That one's awesome. Okay, so I promised I'd do this and I'm regretting it, but here's the definitive ranking of all 15 Puppet Master movies. Fuck. Okay, first off, Retro Puppet Master and Dr. Death, they're gonna go here. One I haven't seen and the other isn't out yet, so I really can't rank them objectively. So let's just move on. All right, number 13. Puppet Master, Axis Termination. The only one I didn't finish, which should tell you everything you need to know, one out of 10. Number 12, Puppet Master, The Legacy. It's just a clip show. That is all it is. I really didn't like it. 
One out of 10. Slightly better than Termination because I was able to finish it. Number 11, Curse of the Puppet Master. This is what happens when someone asks the question, how can we make a Puppet Master movie that also feels like a Hallmark movie? A question I didn't think needed answered. The fact a guy got his dick drilled though is kind of funny. So everything else is bad though. One out of 10. Number 10, Puppet Master X, X is Rising. The one with the hot Nazi, could have been worse. Two out of 10. Puppet Master 5, the final chapter. It's not the final chapter, two out of 10. Puppet Master 2, I don't even know what happened in this one anymore. Two, maybe out of 10. Number 7, Puppet Master vs. Demonic Toys. Corey Feldman's performance alone bumps this one up from being the 8th worst to the 7th worst. 3 out of 10 for Corey's wig. Number 6, Puppet Master Axis of Evil. I literally have no idea what happened in this one anymore. I just needed to put one here. 3 out of 10. Number 5, The Original Puppet Master. It's not good, but it somehow managed to spawn 14 follow-ups. It was cool to see the uncle from Christmas Vacation though kill himself. 3 out of 10. 4, Blade the Iron Cross. It's fucking Blade. It's still a 4 out of 10 movie though. Puppet Master 3, Talon's Revenge. A six-armed cowboy puppet shot a Nazi commander out the window of a brothel. That alone makes this one of the greatest films ever made. Other than that, it's fine. 4.2 out of 10. Number 2, Puppet Master 4. It's got plank. Do you need more of an explanation? Four and a half out of ten. Number one, Puppet Master The Littlest Reich. This movie gave me everything I've wanted from this goddamn franchise. Puppets killing people. I can't believe that this idea was so hard to pull off. This movie fully embraced the silliness and insanity of the idea of puppets killing people and just said fuck it and made a damn entertaining movie. Will I ever watch it again? Probably not. Also, Nelson Franklin is in it. That guy's great. Six out of 10, it's stupid and fun. Well, that's it, it's over. I never have to talk about these movies again. Well, until next time, make sure to take care of yourself and make sure you stay hydrated.